Nintendo has Mario, Sega has Sonic, Xbox has MasterChef, but who is the mascot for PlayStation? Well, there is an official one, but it's not Angry Dad, it's not Little Robot Dude, and it's not Polygon Man before you history buffs out there start piping up. No, because this is Toro Inoue. He is a cat, and he has a long, long list of games on PlayStation consoles. And in Sony's homeland of Japan, he is the official mascot for PlayStation. In this video, I'm going to look at every single one of these games across PS1, Pocket Station, PS2, PSP, PS3, PS Vita, and more. Instead of milking out a long introduction of who Toro is and why he's only prominent for Sony in Japan, let's get right to the good stuff and dive in straight to the first game and I'll explain everything along the way. July the 22nd, 1999, saw the release of Doko Demo Ishio for the PlayStation. This was six months after the release of this little bad boy. The Pocket Station. Why is this important though? Well, if you look at the back of Doko Demo Ishio, it says that you require a Pocket Station to play. Although it's a little hard to see on mine because there's a bloody crack through the case. Now, just in case you don't know what the Pocket Station is, and you might not because Japan is greedy and keeps all the good stuff for itself, it's an accessory for the PS1 designed to be a competitor to Sega's VMU for the Dreamcast. The Pocket Station is a PS1 memory card, clock, and tiny game system all in one. Certain PS1 games contained mini games Games that could be transferred over to the Pocket Station and played on the go. Games like Ridge Racer Type 4 and Street Fighter Zero 3 contain Pocket Station games which, when played on the tiny device, could unlock new items for their associated PS1 game when the Pocket Station was reconnected back to the main console. In the case of Dokodema Ishio, half of the experience is the Pocket Station side of the game. Probably the easiest way to think about this is like an advanced Tamagotchi that lives in your pocket station and you can take it out with you anywhere and interact with it while you're out the house. Then when you come back home you plug your pocket station back into your PlayStation and continue interacting with Toro on your television. But there's a lot more to it than that but before we start going in really deep I want to apologize for the quality of the initial recordings. Because of what's involved here I have to use actual PlayStation hardware. In my case I'm using a PS2 and then component leads which are plugged into a HD HDMI converter and then plugged into my PC capture card. You can't just run this game through some program on your computer, even if you do have the USB official memory card reader. Trust me, I tried. And I can't use my Japanese backwards compatible 60 gig PS3 because even though the console knows when you connect a pocket station to it via the USB memory card reader, when a game is loaded, it will only allow you to access the standard memory card images on the hardware and won't even look for the pocket station. Well done, Sony. You went to all this trouble to make an adapter and to even program the XMB to recognize the pocket station, but you didn't add the ability to actually use it. You idiots. But this is what we've got, so let's just get on with Toro's first game. The first time you boot this game up, after you see the title screen, you'll get this Pogapi selection screen. Pogapi is just one of the words the Japanese have made up by mashing two other words together. In this case, the words pocket and people have been unceremoniously slammed together to form Pogapi. We have Toro Inoue, who outside Japan is simply known as Sony Cat. Obviously, he's the main character, and I'll go into detail about him as I play the game. But we can also select a robot called R. Suzuki, who has a four-sided head, which has a different emotion on each side, and he will rotate it to show you what he's feeling at any given time. Next, we have Jun Mahara, who is a rabbit. She's trendy, up-to-date on her pop culture, and a bit pretentious. She's a self-described love expert. 
being a rabbit and all that. After that, we have Ricky, who is a green frog, who loves sports and dreams of being a world famous fighter. He likes to work out and is always training to get stronger. Finally, we have Pierre Yamamoto, who is a half French, half Japanese dog. He dreams of living his life in France. Once you've selected your Pogapi that you want to use, you now have to give your little guy a name. This is done using an on-screen pocket station, and thankfully, if you scroll to the side, you'll find English letters. The next step is putting details about yourself, your name, your gender, your birthday, your blood type, and your telephone number. With all this out the way, the game will now create a Pogapi mini game for the pocket station based on the information you have just entered, and then you can begin. Day one started for me with Toro entering his room, turning on the lights, and he begins talking. He tells me his name is Keb, which is the name I gave him, and that he dreams of becoming human. Now, I don't actually think he means he wants to transform from being a cat into a human. I'm pretty sure he actually means he wants to learn what it means to be human and sort of mimic that. So his idea is to study humans, and he wants me to teach him about human things. Now I have control, but if I don't touch the controller, Toro will meander around the room, watch TV, listen to music, and a bunch of other stuff. If at any point I press the action button, it strikes up a conversation with Toro. Most of the time, this will result in a question, which I can normally answer yes or no. But if I press the menu button, I can now give Toro something to eat, check his stats, or most importantly, teach him a word. And this is the key part of the game. You type a word in, and thankfully you can select from English letters, then you have to tell him what it means by using a menu system. So I've told him the word apple, and then I have to choose if it's something famous, a person, a place, an activity, a food, an animal, and so on. Within each option, there's a whole bunch of new menus lurking underneath where I can go into much further detail. I messed up here with apple and totally selected the wrong option. Option because at first I didn't see I could scroll down on the first menu for more descriptions and I've told him that Apple is an activity. Now I've got myself into a bit of a mess because I have to define how many people can do Apple as an activity at once and now he's got totally the wrong idea about apples. <laughs> Don't make this mistake because the meanings and words that you teach Toro will be remembered and he will use the words you teach him in future conversations as well as asking you questions around them. So if you tell him apples is some sort of three person group activity, then you're going to have some very bizarre conversations in the coming days. I spoke to him a bit more, I gave him some food, and he went to sleep. I saved the game and turned the PlayStation off, then continued on with my day with Toro now in my pocket. When I checked on him again, he was still asleep, but I wasn't having none of that, so I woke him up and began a conversation with him about food. What I can't do though is any of the link up stuff that is outlined in the game's manual. Pocket stations can communicate with each other, and two pocket stations with Dokodema Ishio can link and you can swap learnt words with each other and play a word association game called Shiratori. What I can do though is teach him more words using pretty much the same interface as before and start a conversation with him. Even though Toro is an adult cat, he has a very childlike wonder about himself and he seems to like to play around. On day two, I booted up the PlayStation and noticed that a new poster had appeared in the background of Toro's apartment, as well as another banner on the other side of the room. As the pocket station has a clock built into it, the game can measure real world time and things will appear in the game the longer that you play it. Anyway, I gave him something to eat, then I got to see another room when the camera followed Toro when he went to the toilet. I taught Toro more words and even tried some words that I thought might have some special bonus to them. There was no special bonus. I looked in Toro's diary and he had written an entry about the previous day. I took him back into handheld mode again and he seemed to need the toilet quite a bit. Maybe I fed him some food he didn't like. I also refrained from putting the included stickers all over my pocket station. Although later, I did put a few on my PC. That will annoy the people that love to keep their games complete in box. On day three, I began by looking into Toro's diary to see what 
what he'd written about the day before. And then I got a look at his apartment and even more stuff was in it. Taught him a few new words, had a conversation with him about some food that he likes. His apartment has got even more stuff in now. And when you compare it to day one, you can see quite the difference. And what gets put into his apartment is different on every new playthrough. When I moved back into handheld mode, I could see Toro was in a very good mood and he was running around. I'm pretty sure he was happy when I was talking to him too. I found translating the pocket station text quite hard. A game of Doko Demo Isho is not infinite though, there is an end. Now it can either be a bad ending where you leave your pocket station in a drawer, forget about it for two weeks, turn it on only to find that Toro has left because you stopped interacting with him. Or it can be the good ending in which Toro feels that you've taught him enough and leaves happy now that he can apply everything you've taught him to his adventure that he wants to have, now he's leaving you. Either way, you'll need to start a fresh game if you want to continue playing. Anyway, maybe from here you would like to take over, because you can. Remember I said I had that USB memory card adapter? Well, I made a copy of the save file and uploaded it to the Dodgica blog. This is a blog style website that I upload PlayStation game saves to, and that includes saves to all the games that you'll see in this video. The next game in the series was released on the 27th of January 2000. This is Koneko Mo Ishio, and it's the only game in the series that I don't actually own. But that doesn't mean I can't play some footage I pulled from a Japanese player while I tell you about it. So this is basically an expansion set for the main game. It requires you to have both Dokodoma Ishio and a save file for it on your pocket station. With both of these things, it will now generate a new story which acts like a sort of prequel to the original game, where Toro is now just a kitten. Functionally, it's the same game, but now with different background and more child-friendly themes of conversation. Because in the first game, every so often, Toro would talk about doing research on women by using naughty magazines and talks about becoming sexy. So Konekomo Ishio is really an anti-furry but child-friendly version of the same game. But releasing this as an add-on rather than its own thing seems to be a bit of a botched idea if you ask me. Why make a child-friendly version of a game but still require the child to have the grown-up version in order to be able to play it? What sort of logic is that? But now, something very different. Released on the 24th of May 2001, this is I Mode Mo Ishio, and it's probably the most interesting from an historical standpoint because, like the previous title, it's an expansion pack for Doko Demo Ishio, but this expansion adds online functionality to the game. Now, before you laugh uncontrollably because the PS1 couldn't go on the internet, I'd like to remind you that this is Japan, and Japan is greedy and keeps all the best stuff for itself. In this case, the official PlayStation to mobile phone link cable. This was an officially released Sony product that used the early internet connections from mobile phones back then to add online functionality to the PS1. Browse the internet, check your email, even works on the PS2. Now your PlayStation can connect to the internet, it's time to take Toro online. Or it would be if A, I had a 20 year old phone able to connect to my PlayStation, B, I was actually in Japan and able to connect my non-existent phone to the online service, and C, if the service hadn't shut down just a year and a half after its release. I mean, I can see how this might not have been popular. The barrier to entry is pretty damn high, and it's outlined on the game's case. So you need a copy of Dokodema Ishio, obviously a PlayStation, a pocket station, the link cable, and an internet-enabled mobile phone. Although you can still run the game in an offline mode, there's not really much here. You do get a new room for Toro to move around in and it upgrades the pocket station game with a new title screen. You can teach him new words while in offline mode, but without the connection to the service, this add-on disc is pretty pointless now. It's a shame as I would have loved to have tried out the online word exchange and to see the special eye mode functions that the game allows your phone to do. But unless some of the smart people over the, at the Toro Friend Dungeon Discord can find a way to mod this game, this is where the PS1 section of this video comes to a close.
On the 29th of November 2001, what translates to Toro on Holiday was released for the brand new PlayStation 2. And this means I can now use my PS3 to capture quality footage. Pocket Station functionality is out of the window as we now play future Toro games on just the main consoles themselves. But that's okay, because now Toro is no longer limited to just his room, he can go outside and explore an entire town. Now, I see what was going through the minds of the developers here. They saw that the PS2 can play DVD films, so they've gone berserk and film locations around the town with the intention of Toro leaving his PS1 room and coming for holiday right here. Basic gameplay is still very much the same. You're teaching Toro words and what things are, and he'll use those words in conversation with you. But now he's not just stuck in one room, you direct him around the town and he'll ask you questions about the things he sees. So just in this hotel, he'll ask you about the bathing room and what it's all about before giving it a go. He will even talk to other people he meets along the way, like members of the hotel staff and his fellow poker pee friends who show up now and again around various places in the town. The town is surprisingly large and actually has a day and night cycle that happens. As a game, I found it more fun than the PS1 games as there's a lot more variety in each gameplay session due to all the different locations and possible things that can happen. It must have been a bit of a marketing push behind this title as I found these McDonald's collectible cards online that were released around the game's launch. But anyway, I think this game is actually quite fun and if you're looking to play the PS2 Toro games, make sure you start with this one and there's a very good reason for that. Released on the 24th of April 2003, this is Dokodema Ishio My Picture Book. This is actually very different to all the previous games, and you'll see why in a minute. But if you're going to play these Toro PS2 games, make sure this is the second one. Here's why. After the title screen, the first thing the game does is search the memory cards to see if a save file from Toro's Holiday is present. If it detects one, it will create a new save file for this game as normal, but it will carry over all the words that you taught Toro in the previous games, and these words will get used in the stories that happen in this new title. With that part out of the way, you'll get this intro of this old guy talking to you, and this is where it started to fall apart for me. So far I've been playing these games by pointing my phone at the screen while Google Translate has been running, so I know pretty much what's going on. But when this man showed up and started waffling away, I had had no clue. Thankfully, in-game it's still text-driven, but that doesn't really make it fun. You see, what we have here is a rather weak choose-your-own-adventure game, where you read the text of the story and then you're given a menu and you have to pick from what you want to do from the options given. To say it's not very exciting is a bit of an understatement, and any fun you manage to pull from this game is totally unintentional. The first picture book story you go through is basically Toro meeting a dog, but that almost Shakespearean tale was dragged out for 10 minutes. The second one is Pierre being temporarily in charge of a clothes shop, and you can make it rather funny by choosing all the worst answers and creating this ridiculous scene where a man walks in wearing only his underwear. Outside of that though, the only reason to play this game from a gameplay perspective is to create a save file that has now all the words learnt from Toro's Holiday and this game, and there's a good reason for that. The third Toro game for the PS2 was released on the 1st of April 2004. This is Dokodema Ishio and the Shooting Star. The title screen tells us this while it plays a version of When You Wish Upon a Falling Star but with Japanese lyrics. After this, we are greeted by a save data import screen. So again, this game will look on your memory cards for save data from previous games and create a new save file for this game, but will import all the words learned from whichever data you select. Now, considering my picture book save file was already generated by importing the Toro on holiday data, by choosing the picture book file to import, I'm bringing over two games worth of information. The game starts with you 
you playing as this guy. You've got off a bus here outside this Japanese style apartment block. Straight away, I get some serious Mason Ikoku vibes. And I know that inside each apartment is going to be a different wacky character living there. The guy goes inside and I was bang on the money. Straight away, the different maniacs that live here start introducing themselves to you as you make your way to your apartment. Once you get inside, before you've even had the chance to unpack, you hear the toilet flush. You go check it out and it's Toro. Even though your guy has never met this cat before, he's already in your house using your toilet. He just asks Toro to help him unpack and then lets him stay there because reasons. They unpack and then sit by the window and Toro starts talking about wanting to see a shooting star. At this point, you can now start teaching Toro new words and have conversations with him. After you've talked for a bit, as luck would have it, you see a shooting star. This is followed by an even brighter light and something crashing down to earth, causing the building to shake. When the camera cuts back, you're both standing in the hallway discussing that you should go both go outside and find the whereabouts of the thing that fell to earth. At this point, the game introduces you to the main bit of music that plays during dialogue. It's this short, annoying loop that will make you want to rip your own ears off. Either way, you now have full control, and as you make your way outside, you'll find other residents of the building who will talk to you about the fallen object. The woman tells you that it fell on Mount Eura, so you decide to make your way there. So what we have here is a dialogue heavy adventure game that has Toro as your sidekick. And Toro has the same learning and conversational functions as the previous games. The adventure will take you to more and more new areas where you'll meet other new characters who normally have some sort of problem they need help dealing with and now that will allow you to progress further towards the goal. I'm not sure if I prefer this or Toro's Holiday but it's definitely more video game here with tasks you need to complete and puzzles you have to solve. But Toro's Holiday is a fun relaxing chilled experience. They're different games but they're both worth playing but there is still one more PS2 game in the series. Toro game for the PS2 was released on the 2nd of September 2004 and this is Dokodera Ishio Toro and more parties. If you're planning on playing all the PS2 games, play this last because again, it features a save data importer at the beginning of the game. So if you played all the games in the order I presented them in this video, which is also the order they were released in, your Toro and the Shooting Star save data should have all the data from Toro's Holiday and Toro's Picture Book. So for this fourth and final PS2 game, you're importing three games worth of information before you even begin. Now the box says that not only is this game compatible with eye toy camera, it also has online functions, which is great. What's not great though is I have no idea what earth I'm meant to do here. Toro goes into this yard of stray cats who try to keep away from him. There are some things that you can look at and talk with Toro still, but beyond that, I don't seem to be able to progress the game at all. I've no idea what I'm missing. I'm pretty sure I've tried to select everything on screen that has any sort of action and it just leads me to a dead end. Don't know what I've missed, but if you know, write it in the comments so I can feel like a right clown because it's probably something really obvious. Anyway, enough with the PS2 games because it's time to downsize. On the 7th of December 2004, a PlayStation Portable remake of the first PS1 game was released. This is Dokodera Ishio Portable, and just like the previous games, I'm using real hardware to film this on. This is a PSP 3000 model, so it has the feature to output to component video so I can get a nice clean capture. Now, this isn't just a simple remaster of the PS1 game. For a start, there's no need for a pocket station, considering that the PSP is already a handheld system, but the graphics are better, it runs smoother, and from a gameplay perspective, it offers more variety than the PS1 games because there are more places you can go and things to see. How 
However, in the general gameplay experience, this is mostly the same game. Toro lives in a house and wants you to teach him words and talk to him. But I had a much better time with this version, although a lot of that is probably down to the fact that I had played the PS1 game for quite a while, so I was now familiar with all the menus and was far more prepared to get the most for this game. There are some changes though. Even though the game can still measure time, thanks to the PSB's built-in clock, new things don't just automatically appear in Toro's room. What happens now is every so often you can trigger an event where one of the stray cats that you see normally living on top of Toro's house will come over to you and offer you a gift. I found that these gifts were only offered during an event I could trigger when I was at my in-game work building. You'll answer a few questions and you'll get one of two boxes offered to you. These will be decorations for your house. So during my playtime, the locations I got to go to were Toro's house, Toro's rooftop, my place of work and a park area. The areas outside of Toro's room are decorated with signs that have different words on that I've taught Toro on various days. I had more fun teaching in words this time, as well as hello, goodbye. I told him that selector can be used as a greeting. When the crowd say ball, selector. When the crowd say ball, selector. And that your mum was a joke that people told, as well as many other fun words to use. Now, as I was really used to teaching Toro new words, I could start to see how much of a pain this game would be to translate to a general English speaking audience. For a start, when you teach Toro the name of a person, one of the sub menus you need to choose from is their social standing in relationship to yourself. If you understand Japanese culture, then you know your sans, your chans, and your senpais. But to most people, the whole idea of contextual social standing is completely alien. And this game is full of Japanese idiosynchronies like this. So after playing it, I can see what a complete nightmare this would be to officially translate just to English, let alone something like French, where every noun is masculine or feminine. As much as I like the PS1 game and I think the pocket station side of things is super interesting. The fact is, is that the PSP version is just better in almost every way. Plus this game can do one other thing, which you'll find out in a moment. On the 15th of June 2006, the second PlayStation Portable game was released, and this is Doko Demo Ishio. Let's go to school. Toro and his Pogapi friends have blown off the idea of learning about humans directly from humans and have all decided to go to school to learn about the world instead. So you start the game by selecting which Pogapi you want to use, and next you're greeted by a screen that takes you to an import save data from Doko Demo Ishio Portable and carry on all the words that you taught Toro then. So it starts off with Toro in his room saying that he wants to go to school. Then it cuts to his day one school introduction ceremony where some rules of the school are outlined. Essentially, each school day is split into three periods. Each period is either a lesson or a homeroom event. The lessons are maths, literature, language, sports and geography. In between each period, you can visit one of the other rooms in the school and each room functions like a different option screen. You can visit the headmaster's office for the settings menu, the club room to teach new words and play Shiatori against other people, the audio visual room to go online and download updates for the game. You have the school supply store where you can buy clothing items and customize your character and you have the staff room where you can check out your progression status. Each lesson will have the class of friends talking about the subject in question. You as a player have to answer their questions so they can all gain more knowledge and you'll have a chance to earn a star. Star points are the currency used in the the school store to buy new clothes. During homeroom, the friends will talk about whatever they like, but generally they will use the words they've learned, including the ones imported from your save game data. When you strip this right back to its core gameplay, really it's the same as Dokodema Ishio, where you are teaching Toro new things, but the delivery system is totally different now. Instead of a short, direct, but ultimately repetitive way of teaching Toro new things, you now have a longer, more roundabout, but ultimately more interesting way of doing things. Even though ultimately you are achieving the same goal as the previous games, because the structure of the game is totally different, it does feel like a totally different experience. Is it better? I am undecided myself, but it does feel like a very different game to what has come before.
On the 11th November 2006, Toro entered the HD generation with Mainichi Ishio on PlayStation 3. As well as high quality visuals, the other big change is that this was a free to use live service game. And I say was because as with all live service games, they eventually shut down and this one is no exception. But lucky for both you the viewer and me the video creator, I did actually play this back in the day so I can try and tell you about my experience using it. Try it is the right word though because yes although I do have the trophies for playing this game on my main PSN account I'm trying to recall what happened in a game I played 14 years ago so my memory is a little fuzzy but the main bulk of the game is that you'd log in and Toro and Kuro would present a sort of news report show where they'd tell you about events going on in Japan if I remember correctly an overwhelming amount of what they would report on would be various restaurants what food they serve and different PlayStation games coming out. You didn't have any of the Tamagotchi style gameplay of the previous games, no. Mainichi Ishio was mainly a daily event broadcasting live service application. Although this did evolve over time and other things were added like mini games and decorations for Toro's house. The decorations were themed around reported events. So if you logged in and watched a news report on the new Siren Blood Curse game, you can now put a Siren post up in Toro's room. It was a fun little window into events and culture in Japan, as well as Japanese PlayStation game releases, quite a few, never of which saw release outside of the country. What was weird though, is that on the UK PlayStation Network, and other countries too, you could get Mainichi Ishio car decorations for your vehicles in Ridge Racer 7. As with every other Toro game so far, it was never released outside of Japan, but you could go onto Ridge Racer 7 and still download these decorations, and this is the equivalent of You will never get this, you will never get this. La, 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 la. Over time, all the extra features that got added, mini games you could play, and Toro storylines that got squeezed into the game made the whole thing quite messy to navigate and had gone well beyond the original vision for this title. So they shut it down in 2009 and created a whole new Toro live service, which was worse. 20th of December 2007, the digital only PSP title Dokodemo Ishio Let's Go to School Training Edition was released on the PlayStation Network. Information about this game online is very limited. Outside of a few Japanese websites, there's not a lot out there. Even the Dokodemo Ishio wiki doesn't mention this game at all, and it can be easily confused as some sort of demo version of the main Let's Go to School game, but it's actually a standalone game that was sold for just eight. 100 yen and once i finally managed to get into my psp i found out why it was so cheap so starting this game up after the title screen and after the player select you can import your save data from doko demo ishio let's go to school and having plenty of words already to begin with helps a lot because Basically, this game is a collection of mini word games. That's right, for 800 yen, you're getting the Shiatori word linking game ripped out of Doko Demo Ishio Let's Go to School and sold as a standalone title. Even hardcore Doko Demo Ishio fans might want to give this one a miss, but because of the lack of information online, I had no idea what I was getting into. And to say I didn't stick around too long, it's quite the understatement. Unless you absolutely can't get enough of Japanese word games, avoid this one. Yet another digital PSP release was Manichi Ishio Portable, which hit the PSN on the 15th of October 2008. Unlike the PS3 version we saw earlier, this game does have an online mode which you can still access, kind of. The issue here is that if you want to install this onto your PSP, you're going to have to use unofficial firmware as it was taken off the PSN ages ago but when you boot it up it'll ask you to connect online which is clearly something you're not going to want to do with unofficial firmware but if you use your pc to get this game up and running that online connection can be easily bypassed and you launch yourself into the game However, the large part of this title was its live service aspect, with daily updates about PlayStation and Japan in general, and 
all of that is absolutely off the table and lost to time. But what you can do is watch Toro mess around in his room and go to the garden. In the garden, you can plant seeds and grow flowers. I didn't stick around long enough to see what the flowers did, but I did explore enough of the game to see there was a shop run by Kuro. In the shop, you can buy gifts for Toro and seeds for the garden, but these things cost coins. And I'm going to go out and limb here and guess that coins were earned by viewing the live service updates. Although this game does give you one flower for free when you start. Like the PS3 game, this was shut down in 2009 to make way for the new live service Toro game, which we'll talk about soon enough. The next game was released for the PlayStation 3 on the 18th of December 2008, and this is everybody's putter golf with Toro. It's basically a mini golf game built using the everybody's golf engine, but with Toro in and sold as a digital only title for 600 yen. Now before we get into the details of this game, let's just check that price once again. This nine hole mini golf title for the PS3 is 600 yen, but this word linking game on the PSP is 800 yen. Both of these downloads are just bits ripped out of full price games and packaged as a mini experience, but only one of them is actually fun, and it's not the PSP game. Why it costs so much more is mental. Because for 600 yen, you can't go wrong with this one. It's what the title says, an everybody's golf powered putting challenge featuring Toro. It's nine holes, each a little bit more difficult than the last, and each increasingly more interesting than the last. You can either play solo as Toro or a versus mode against Jasmine, who is one of the characters from Everybody's Golf. Plus, you can play this with normal controls or use the DualShock's motion control features. Don't use the motion control, it's a complete mess and your ball will just go out of bounds the moment you so much as look at it. But with the normal control system, it's a perfectly playable game. And if you download it from the Hong Kong store rather than the Japanese one, it's all in English. There was no release outside of Asia though, because the purpose of this cheap digital game was to serve as a cross promotion for Mainichi Ishio, which didn't leave Japan. If you're watching this video in 2023, then this game is still available to buy on Asian versions of the PlayStation 3 store, and for the price, it's well worth it. On the 23rd of July 2009, the next Toro game hit the PS3. This is Toro, let's party! And thankfully, this is another Toro game to get an English Hong Kong release, so we can all see what's actually going on without having to stop and use Google Translate every five seconds. So what we have here is essentially a mini game collection that can be played solo or as a party game with friends. If you choose the solo route, you can still play all the mini games, but they're linked together by a story about Toro traveling around learning about humans. Generally, Toro will go somewhere, meet someone, and they'll ask him to do something. That something will involve you playing a predetermined minigame, and once you succeed, Toro will move to the next area, meet someone else, and repeat the process. If you just want to play the minigames, then you can do that too. Head over to the minigame mode and play as either solo versus computer or versus friends in local play. Obviously, you want to know what sort of games there are here, so here's a sample. Some, but not all the minigames, use the motion control functions. This basketball game requires you to thrust the controller forward to throw the ball. You've got this disco mini game where you have to press the buttons in the order they come out. The button symbols disappear once they're pressed, but if a symbol doesn't get pressed fast enough and reaches the end, it's game over. There's another motion game where you have to wave the controller up and down to make Toro's wings flap and you want to get them as high as you can within the time limit. You've got a ninja star training game where you have to thrust the controller in the direction of the target. Pulling the tablecloth where you have to yank the controller in a way as to not knock over the stuff on the table. This takes quite a bit of getting used to. There's about 30 games to play, all Toro themed and all varying in quality. But wait, there's more! 
but if you have the Hong Kong version, you get some PlayStation 3 XMB themes as an extra on the disc. But if you have the Japanese version, the extras are far better. You get two downloads for the PSP. One is a clock application for your handheld that is done in the style of the Pocket Station Dock or Demo Ishio game. I really like this and this is my clock now. The other is a demo version of my Imichi Ishio Portable that we saw earlier. Now this is really interesting because the only function here is that it has three of the live service updates which you're able to view offline as they're saved within the demo. You have two stories about Toro and one that acts as a promotion for the PlayStation 3 version of Manichi Ishio. And if someone wanted a good example of the typical live service broadcast that you would have seen circa 2008, this is what I would point you towards. The way this is shown, the pacing and the delivery from Toro and Koro makes up the bulk of how the live service broadcasts actually were back in the day as I remember them. As a way of preserving a part of the history of Mainichi Ishio, I'm really glad this is here, but I really do like that clock. On the 11th of November 2009, Sony went and done a bad thing. They shut down Mainichi Ishio for both PS3 and PSP, and in its place, they released Weekly Toro Station. Now, this should have been an easy home run for Sony. Mainichi Ishio had got messy, and what the developers were trying to add in terms of games and content delivery had far outgrown what was actually possible in the game's current framework. So they tore it down and started with a more feasible feature-rich weekly updated live service broadcast. But instead of just giving users what they had before, but now better, Sony decided to hide some of the game's functions behind a subscription. If you didn't pay, you lived outside instead of Toro having a house. There were other features behind the paywall, but I never paid for it, so let's just assume it was some sort of exclusive content. But free users did get the weekly live service broadcast still, and many of these have actually been preserved and uploaded to YouTube. Like the previous game, the PS3 version is pretty much useless now, and even the PSP version does next to nothing if it can't connect to the online service and you'll just get an error if you try. The last game for PlayStation consoles was released on the 17th of December 2011, and this is Toro's friend network for PlayStation Vita. This is the first and only Toro game to find a release outside of Asia, as it was released in 2013 in America. However, it didn't come out in Europe, so I never got it because I run official firmware on my machine so I can collect the PSN trophies in my games, so I can't install it to my console. But I do have this promotional video that you've been watching so far, and to be fair, it does a really good job of covering everything you need to know about it. Toro's Friend Network serves as a new way to find friends on the PlayStation Network with the aid of Facebook and Twitter. This game also has a mode called Toro's Friend Dungeon, which is what the Discord is named after, which is a simple dungeon crawler RPG where you and online friends defeat enemies to win items for your avatar. This isn't how Toro's PlayStation series should have ended. Toro and all his Poker P friends need to make a PlayStation 5 return. Personally, I'd like to see the first game rebuilt but with new features in it, sort of like what we saw in the PSP remake. What would be cool is that instead of having a pocket station to take Toro away from the main system, you could get some sort of app on your phone to take Toro with you on the move. Sony needs to make this and not let Toro go out like this. There is one more Toro game in the main series though, but this video was really meant to focus on the PlayStation series games, so I won't go too deep here. After a long break, Toro returned on the 1st of October 2019, but this time it was to mobile phones. Now, on the surface level, this was a simple match three puzzle game with a storyline. However, the story was actually quite vast and featured many of the Pogabee friends. There was more to this than just puzzles and story. There was special goals to 
to hit, coins and stars to earn, which could be spent on clothing, items for Toro's in-game house, and for gameplay benefits. I'm using the past tense to talk about this game because the servers for this game have been closed and it's been taken off the App Store. It's a shame the app was taken down though, because just before the end, an update was made to the game so you could still access the entire story in an offline mode. So if you have an Android phone, you could still sideload this onto your device, I'd imagine. But for dirty iPhone users like myself, it's long gone. But this really does mark the end of all the mainline Toro Inore video games, at least for now. really made it sound like we'd come to the end, didn't I? Well, that was just the mainline games. We're not quite done yet. Remember PlayStation All-Stars on the PS3? The game that was basically Smash Brothers, but with PlayStation characters in? The game that is crying out for a sequel for the PS5? Seriously, Sony, make a new PlayStation All-Stars. Well, Toro starred as a selectable character in that game, and not only is it amazing fun still to this day, but getting to the seventh match and watching Toro and Kuro have a conversation conversation with Hiachi from Tekken is as ridiculous as it is hilarious. I did a full playthrough with Toro, partially to get footage for this section of the video and partially to get the trophy with Toro's face on. This wasn't the only PS3 fighting game that Toro and Kuro starred in though. You could also find the pair in Street Fighter Cross Tekken as exclusive characters for the PS3 version. You could only access them in versus mode though and they're basically just small reskinned versions of of Ken and Ryu, although that's fine by me because that's how I roll in these games. The other big PS3 title you could find Toro in was PlayStation Home. This had an entire area themed around Toro that was released to coincide with the release of Toro Let's Party. There are actually two versions of this area. One is for the Japanese version of PlayStation Home and one for the Hong Kong version. Right now, you're looking at a YouTube video I've borrowed from the Your PlayStation Home YouTube channel of the Hong Kong version that had everything labeled up in English. But something this doesn't show you is that one of the things you could get out of this area was a special Toro headpiece. I know this was a thing because I recorded it myself on an old video camera back in the day. I was on the Japanese version of Home and happened to log in during a random cosplay event and one of the onlookers is wearing a Toro head. Aside from all this, other PS3 games actually had Toro themed DLC, like Everybody's Golf, Little Big Planet, and When Vikings Attack. The PS4 had a Toro theme you could apply to the user interface that looks really good. I don't think this was available in every PSN region though, and it's one you had to pay for. And for the PS5, although there are no Toro games so far, in Astrobot's playroom, you can find a pair of Astros dressed up as Toro and Kuro dancing by a pocket station, which is clearly a reference to Doko Demo Ishio. And if you're a member of PlayStation Stars, every so often, rewards actually have Toro on them. So there is still hope that Sony may have at least one more go at making a Toro PlayStation game. In Japan, Toro Inore was a big deal. In 2001, Fuji TV started making short promos featuring Toro and later on a movie length video. There's been various typing tutorial programs for home computers that feature Toro and even before the advent of the iPhone, the Japanese had mobile phone games that featured Sony's famous cat bringing joy to the old flip phones. Capcom of all people got a Toro license and created a coin pusher of all things. But in Japan, because of certain gambling laws, they have to be medal pushers because I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to have arcade games where you can win money. You have to change your money into medals which are the same shape as coins, then use the medals in the machines, then later change the medals into prizes like stuffed toys. Then there's normally a shop just around the corner that will buy the stuffed toys from you for money. So it's basically gambling, but with extra steps. Aside from the not gambling, but gambling really arcade machines, there is an unholy amount of Toro and Nore merchandise out there. When a Toro toaster and a Doko Demo Ishio fan 
exist, then you know this is serious business. But even PlayStation 2 memory cards and a special version of the PlayStation Vita can be attained with Toro's face on. Toro Nori is a huge part of Sony's history, and I personally find it very strange. It's almost never mentioned at all in the West, which is why I've just spent the best part of 50 minutes walking you through the complete history of Sony's actual official mascot, because no one else is going to do it. Thanks for watching guys, a like, subscribe and comment are very much appreciated. Plus, if you like what you saw, here are some links on the screen now to some of my other videos that I've made that you might like.